Empowerment is authority. It is a sign permission slip to actually seize the day. It's the process of getting stronger and more confident and more engaged. And to be empowered is to move through the world without any kind of fear or any kind of apology. And with these gifts comes an even deeper privilege, I believe, and that is the ability to take charge of your own life, to own yourself and claim your rights. And here's what I know for sure, that to whom much is given, much is expected. And I have been given so much. I've earned it, I've been blessed with it, but I've been given a lot. And that's why I've chosen to use my life to lift other people up. Nobody's journey is seamless or smooth. We all stumble, we all have setbacks. If things go wrong, you hit a dead end, as you will. It's just life's way of saying, time to change course. So ask every failure, this is what I do. Every failure, every crisis, every difficult time, I say, what is this here? to teach me. And as soon as you get the lesson, you get to move on. If you really get the lesson, you pass and you don't have to repeat the class. If you don't get the lesson, it shows up wearing another pair of pants to give you some remedial work. And what I found is that difficulties come when you don't pay attention to life's whisper because life always whispers to you first. first. And if you ignore the whisper sooner or later, you'll get a scream. Whatever you resist persists, but if you ask the right question, not why is this happening, but what is this here to teach me? What is this here to teach me? It puts you in the place and space to get the lesson you need. My friend Eckhart Tolle, uh, who's written this wonderful book uh, called A New Earth, that's all about letting the awareness of who you are stimulate everything that you do. He puts it like this, he says, don't react against a bad situation, merge with that situation instead, and the solution will arise from the challenge. Because surrendering yourself doesn't mean giving up, it means acting with responsibility. I have a very big life, and so people with big lives can do big things. And so I started to think about what was the best Christmas I ever had in my life. I grew up poor, on welfare with my mother for part of my life. And I remember that the best Christmas of my life was when I was 12 years old and my mother had said, we're not gonna have Christmas because we can't afford it. I remember feeling like it's gonna be really hard on Christmas morning to go outside. What am I gonna do when everybody else is outside? That's what I thought. What am I gonna do when everybody else is outside? And what am I gonna do when I have to go back to class and say I got nothing? So that's what I was mostly worried about. And then some nuns showed up. Some three nuns came to our house and they gave me a doll and they bought us food and we had our Christmas. That was the best Christmas of my life because somebody remembered and I wasn't going to have to be the kid that said I got nothing. So I wanted to be able to create that same feeling for children who had nothing. So I decided to go to South Africa. Originally, I wanted to do a million kids and then just realized with, I only had four weeks vacation. So in four weeks, I could not reach a million kids because I didn't want to just write a check, send a donation. I wanted to be able to look in each kid's face and say to that child, somebody remembered you. And so that's what I did with my life this Christmas. I took 41 people from here, hired another 50 people over there, and we were a traveling caravan from one village to the next. We did 2,000 kids a day. We had parties for children who were orphans. And it was singularly, I will tell you, I could weep thinking about it, the singularly the best experience of my life. The singularly best experience of my life. The first day in Africa where we had 280 kids in a room and every single one of those kids had lost a parent. Every single one of those children, they were age three to 17 in that room. And my team that you're talking about, I have the greatest team in the world. My team in the, here in the United States had been in contact with the orphanages so that by the time we got there, we had a present with every child's name on it. 
this summer, every black doll manufacturer in the country had sent me dolls, because these girls had never seen black dolls. And so it was my mission to do for them what the nuns had done for me, was to let the African girl see a black doll. So I wanted every girl to have a black doll. I wanted every boy to have soccer balls. We bought radios, we bought clothes. And the most important thing is we had their names on every box for every child. And I called up the children one by one. And when those children, you know, received their gifts and then waited for the next child to receive their gifts and said, I said, nobody can open their presents until everybody can open their presents. And on the count of three, when I counted to three and those children opened their presents, was the single greatest moment of my life. I have a big life, so I can take 50,000 presents and do that over and over and over again to orphanage after orphanage. But what I felt in that room for those, from those kids is a lot of what you're talking about and what you're talking about and what you see in the faces of those women. When you look into the eyes of someone and you give them a gift, whether that be a physical gift or it be a gift from your spiritual self, from your presence, from the essence of you, and you see the light, you see the joy. What I felt in that room was not just that I was remembered, that the child felt that I was remembered, but you felt a sense of hope, a sense of validation, a sense of validation that somebody cared about me. And I will tell you that of all the years and shows that I have done, and every theme for every show that I've done, the single common denom denominator that I found that every human being is looking for is validation. Every single person needs to know, wants to feel that they matter, that they matter. And what happened in that room that was the greatest day of my life, I knew that those children knew in that moment that they mattered, that they mattered. And so I encourage you, it's exciting to be able to write a check it's even more exciting to be able to touch one life, to be able to do that for one person. It's like Cynthia was saying, when you can do that for one person, when you can do that, you will know that your life has meaning. And I will tell you, when I left that place, my, my friend Gail and I were there and we we're all boohooing, we're like boohooing with the children, oh my God. And Gail was saying, what is it, what is it, we're so full. And she, Gail said to me, she said, you know, as big as your show is, as big as your show is, what happened in that room seemed bigger. What happened in that room seemed bigger. And that is true. That is true for me who has this big life in a television show. And I'm telling you for everybody here, extending yourself beyond your world, your kids, your family, your stuff, and reaching out to somebody who is not like you, somebody who is like you, who is in need, if you are feeling depressed or you are feeling down or you're feeling like things aren't going the way you want them to go in your life, the way you turn that around is to reach outside of yourself to somebody else. Reach outside of yourself to somebody else. It will change you. It will change you. So it is my intention, my intention to fulfill the dream of the Creator. It is my intention to live to the highest calling and be pressed to the mark of the highest calling that I have come to do. And when you can ask the Creator, ask that which made you you, what is your dream for me? I guarantee you, instead of you trying to define the dream, what is your dream for me? If you're able to lean into the dream that the universe and all the forces of, 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 of light and love and power and grace by all the names that we call God has for you, nobody can touch you. Nobody can touch you. So I want to talk about my dream for you because I have been so blessed to live inside the dream of God. I figured out early on, you know, I had these dreams for myself. I used to tell my father, I'm going to live in a house on a hill. I'm going to have a million dollars. And I learned 
early in my career that the dream I had for myself couldn't compare to the dream that life had for me. So I figured out how to lean in to life, to lean into life and allow the flow that was designed for me to follow, to allow that flow to be my guide. And every decision I've ever made has come from listening to the flow that represents the truth in me that is also the truth in you. You already know the truth. You've been making decisions, having choices fulfilled throughout your life since you were a kid. And being able to make the right choice based upon what is the truth of you is the dream and prayer I hold for you today. Because being able to do that has led me to this stage and many other stages throughout the world. It's the truth. You know, everybody has what I call this instinct, this inner voice. It's called by many names, intuition, the divine, the flow, but everybody has it. And the truth is, every decision I've ever made that led me to the right space and place in my life, I got there because I relied on that inner voice, the truth of me. When I was 30 years old and about to leave Baltimore, because I felt something inside that thing, that instinct, that flow, that truth that said, it's time to move on. And every single person around me, except for my best friend, Gail, that's why she is my best friend, Gail, said, you shouldn't move to Chicago. You should stay here. My bosses said, you're right here in Baltimore. You're a little fish in a big pond. You can grow old here. I go, that's the problem. I don't want to grow old doing the evening news here. So I listened to that inner voice that said, go. And I knew whether I got the job in Chicago, which of course I did or not, that it was time to leave because the truth of me was urging me forward. And every decision I made after coming to Chicago, when everybody said, you should just take a salary. It's too big of a risk to own yourself, to own your show. What if that show fails? Then you're stuck. I said, I'm gonna bet on myself because the truth of me, the inner voice that I was allowed to get still and feel said, take the risk, bet on yourself. Every decision I've ever made, I've come back to that space and allowed myself to live in the place of intentional living. About 1989, after I'd been doing my show for three years, I ran across a book called The Seat of the Soul by Gary Zukav. And in it, he talked about how every action follows is followed by a reaction, which we all know is the third law of motion in physics. But he also said that before there's even a thought or an action, there is an intention. Something struck me about that. There's an intention that follow, that it precedes every thought and every action, and the outcome of your experiences is determined by the intention. At the time, I was a kind of woman who tried to do everything that everybody wanted me to do because I just started making money. The amount of money I made was being published. I got a lot of cousins instantly. A lot of people I used to know in school and friends of mine who all needed things. And I had problems saying no. So this principle of intention is what literally saved and changed the trajectory of my living. Because I started to make my decisions based on what I intended, not just what somebody else wanted me to do or what I thought would please them, but what do I really intend to happen from the outcome of this decision or this choice? And so I started to apply 
this intentional living and this intentional thinking to everything in my life. I said to my producers, do not bring me a show or an idea unless you have a clear intention about why we're doing it, what you want to say, what you want the outcome to be. And changing the paradigm to just from just doing a television show, from just being on TV, to actually intending to be of service to the viewers, changed the trajectory of the show. The reason we were number one for 25 solid years is because we intended to be. We intended to create and to use the opportunity of being able to speak to people every day, to use that as a platform to inform their lives in service, intentionally. And I would say to the producers, do not bring me an idea that I cannot find my thread of truth in, so that I could sit in the seat and ask the questions with the intention of accomplishing something bigger than the interview. So I remember the first time I used this principle of intention. There was a mother on who had lost her 16-year-old daughter. She'd been murdered by her boyfriend. Junior in high school, popular, straight A's, cheerleader. Everybody loved her. Nobody ever suspected that the boyfriend was abusing her. I learned then, back in the 90s, that domestic violence for young girls, for teenagers, is at the same rate of domestic violence for grown women in this country. One out of four girls, 14 to 18, dating, are being abused by their boyfriends. So this girl had hidden it from her mother and her friends because girls hide it because they don't want anybody to know and also because they want to keep the boyfriend. So I went into the green room and I asked the mother, please tell me why you're here. What is your intention? She said, I'm here because your producers asked me to come. I said, but what is the reason you said yes? What is your true intention in being here? And she said, I want people to know that my daughter's life was bigger than her death. Everywhere I go, people only want to talk about her death and how she died and how I didn't know or why I should have known. But I want people to know that my daughter, our daughter was loved. She was loved by her siblings and loved by her friends and she loved us and she had a life that was bigger than her murder. And I said, good, I can do that. I can make sure that people know that your daughter's life meant something, that her being here on the planet Earth for 16 years truly mattered. And here's my intention. I want everybody who hears your daughter's story to be able to see their friend, to see themselves, and to know that to remain silent can be a killer. And so every question that I ask you comes from the point of view of an intention to serve the life of your daughter so that her life would not have been in vain. That's the first show I won an Emmy for, when I aligned the intentions. And since that time, <laughs> since that time, I don't make a decision without getting still, checking in with my inner truth, with what is the real reason I'm doing anything. This whole idea of quantum physics, physics, Newton's law, nature, the way, the order of things, and how life and nature itself operates. And I could see a reflection of my own self, my own being in all of that. And reading Newton's law, third law of motion, which says for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction, was like a religious experience for me. 
I just understand I me, mean, all my bells and whistles and lights and dancing emojis went off because I could see that. I'd experienced a little bit of that in The Color Purple, that beautiful line where Whoopi, as Miss Seeley says, everything you try to do to me is already done to you. That struck me in particular in the movie. And I understood that everybody's actually saying the same thing. Newton's saying the same thing as Miss Seeley is saying the same thing as what we in this country and many other countries call the golden rule, that really what you put out is coming back all the time. And what really struck me is that it's not do unto others as you would have them do unto you. It really is when you do, it's already done because that's law. How did you turn your pain into purpose? Well, before the pain became a purpose, it was just an acknowledgement of what had happened to me. And one of the things we talk about in the What Happened to You book is that anything that has happened to you, and I wanted to just make this point to everybody, there's not a black woman in this room who hasn't been through something that helped her build strength and then something else that helped you build strength, and then something else that helped you build strength. I mean, sometimes you go through so much, you say, God, don't teach me nothing else new today. I don't need no more strength building. But, but this is what I know, is that strength times strength times strength times strength, every time you got stronger, you were building power because strength times strength times strength times strength equals powerful. So we're sitting in a room amongst ourselves with all of these powerful women who have their stories of what happened to you that you can now turn into post-traumatic wisdom. So what I was able to do was to take what had happened to me and to use it as an empathy builder for myself and for other people. And it is my empathy and connection that has allowed me to be the woman that I am today. And so, Anything that has happened to you, if you are willing to learn from it, to open up and no longer allow the stigma and shame to cause you to hide your secrets, but to know that your vulnerability is where your real strength lies and take that pain and turn it into something meaningful for yourself. And as Maya used to say, I wouldn't take nothing for my journey now, not even the sexual abuse, the sexual assault, you know, when I was raped, I didn't even know, I didn't even know what a penis was. And like so many other people in this room who were also sexually assaulted when they were young, I didn't tell anybody because I knew it would be turned on me. I knew I was not in a safe environment where other adults would trust my word. And so I kept it to myself until I was on, literally on an Oprah Winfrey show. Somebody shared their story of abuse and I was like, I thought I was the only one. I thought I was the only person who had been raped at nine and molested until, until I was 14. So I think being able to take your pain and turn it into purpose and power begins first with being able to empathize with other people who've been through the same kind of pain. And everything that's happened to you has also happened for you, if you allow it to be. There's not one thing that has happened to you that you cannot now turn into something that is useful and meaningful in the life that you are now leading forward. How do you stay on the positive path of, you know, positive karma? Mm -hmm. Not even with, in regards to, you know, I, I would never do that again, but when you have so many negative forces, even in your family, that can come in, how do you stay in a positive place okay. with positive karma? If there are a lot of negative people in your life, don't look at them. Look at the energy that you are creating to attract them. Don't look at them, look at yourself. What are you doing to draw those people? Because if you are surrounded by negative people, there's a part of you that's willing to tolerate that. Is there not? I agree, I agree because there were a couple of negative people in my life mm -hmm. and I chose to keep them in my life because I didn't want to push them away. Like you don't push them away because you know because they were friends. So oh. you don't. <laughs> it really comes down to, I mean, who do you want to be in the world? 
Who do you want to be? Not what do you want to do, not what do you want to achieve. Who do you want to be? What is the kind of person when they're reading your eulogy? What do you want the words to be said about the kind of person you have been in the world? Do you know the answer to that question? Do you know the answer to that question? I'm asking that of, 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 of everybody. Do you know what that is? Because in the end, you know, I was just at uh, one of my um, dear Harpo uh, employees, been here for 20 years, her husband died suddenly of a, of a brain aneurysm. It was the most beautiful ceremony. I left that ceremony wanting to be a better human being because the words that were said about him as a human being, as a father, as an uncle, as a friend, the words that people spoke about him were so loving and impassioned that I thought, gee, when I die, I don't want people to talk about the number of shows I did. You want people to talk about how your love affected them, the love that you put out into the world. Yeah, affected them. So if that is the paradigm that you're living from, how can I serve and be the most loving gracious, giving person, whatever my talent is, to all the, all the girls that you're counseling, how do I do that with love, ultimately? I'm telling you, the negative energy will change. And when you become that force for yourself, you won't allow it. I don't care what their title or role is in your life. You just really won't. Sometimes you have to divorce your friends and divorce your family members. And if you handle them with love in doing it, they, they will come back you will have an opportunity to reconcile. I speak from what I know, but I've had family members who, for whom I've said, I will not allow you to treat me this way. I will not allow you to treat me this way. And for one family member, it took them three years to get, when you get some sense, call me and let me know that your senses has returned. <laughs> and what can you do when you've done all you can? You just stand. It's one of my favorite gospel songs. Always gives me goosebump fortification when I hear it, especially when Donnie McClurkin sings, prayed and cried, prayed and cried. After you've done all you can, you just stand. Well, I read a story today about a 65-year-old Ukrainian woman who used to pride herself on her beautiful embroidery work and now is sewing bulletproof vests for soldiers and grateful to still be standing to fight the war. It got me thinking about what it means to keep standing in the face of the most grave adversity. Another story, a man named Yuri huddled in a church basement saying, it's hell here. Imagine 200 people sitting in one room for two days. We can't even breathe fresh air. Well, I don't want to imagine it, but I know we are not supposed to turn away as the days drag on and the Ukrainian people keep standing in the face of such terror and devastation. So in our own lives, what can we do to keep standing for what's right, what's just, for what will bring us peace? Martha Beck says, peace is our home. We deserve, you deserve peace. What can you do this week to take a stand for peace in your own life and the lives of those that you love and make it so? Let me know in the comments below because I love hearing from you and we know that what the world needs from all of us is more peace. It's a big, hard world out there, but you're ready for it. And you're ready because there is nothing more powerful than you using your personality to serve the calling of your soul. Every one of us has been called to the planet to use, and in this moment, in this political moment where everybody is just hysterical, in this moment, the call is for whatever side you choose to be on, to use more of you to bring forth the light. And to do that, you've got to have clarity about who you really are. There is no life without a spiritual life. There is no life without understanding what Pierre de Chardin, the 
philosopher and mystic said, we are spiritual beings having a human experience. So your real job as you go out to try to find one and have all of this anxiety and fear and your real job is to know the truth and to create a spiritual practice that allows you to stay in it. To be clear, I'm not talking about your religion. I'm talking about whatever it is that nurtures the essence of you in such a way that you can do what you came here to do. And one of the reasons why I was able to be so successful all those years on The Oprah Show is because I understood there was really no difference between me and the audience. I was a surrogate for the audience because I know that the audience and you and you and you want the same thing I do. We all want to be able to live out the truest expression, the fullest, purest expression of ourselves as human beings. That's what you want. And in order to do that, you've got to practice, you've got to develop that spiritual muscle that allows you to check in with yourself and not have to ask everybody else about a decision, but to have the clarity of your own knowing, the comfort of your own knowing. And to do that, you've got to live in the space of gratitude. That is my number one spiritual practice. I practice being grateful. And a lot of people say, oh, Oprah, that's easy for you because you got everything. I got everything because I practiced being grateful. I ran across this beautiful quote the other day, I can't even remember who it was from, that said, do not waste your time desiring what other people have. Remember, the things that you now have are things you once only hoped for. So I live in that space every day of practicing gratitude because I know that being grateful wherever you are, whatever place or space in your life, being grateful changes your personal vibration. I was just having a conversation with Sheryl Sandberg the other day about her book, Option B, and we all know she lost her beloved husband, David. And I said, how did you get through it? And she said, by practicing gratitude. I didn't believe it at first, but I started to write down three things every day that I was grateful for. I said, oh, I've been doing that for years. Because when you wake up in the morning, looking at the world, for what you're gonna write down or what you're gonna state to yourself by the end of the day that you're grateful for, you have a different outlook on life. I'm just waiting on somebody to hold the door, see if that makes the list. Some days you only have, I'm still breathing, because life gets in the way sometimes. But practicing gratitude as a spiritual practice to evolve you, to bring you closer to the truth of knowing who you really are, is one of the most valuable things I have ever, ever experienced. And I do it. I have journals and journals and journals and journals filled with five things a day. If you don't believe me, just for a moment, do this. Close your eyes, everybody in here. We're gonna do this for five seconds. You're gonna inhale and on the exhale, just say, thank you. Inhale. Exhale. Do it one more time. Let the, whatever you're most grateful for in your heart in this moment just rise to the surface. Deep breath. Thank you. Open your eyes. Don't you feel better? You feel better. Researchers have shown that if you can just for 17 seconds a day, 17 seconds a day, bring yourself into the space of presence and gratitude you literally change your vibration if you can't give yourself 17 seconds then you don't deserve a good life you can't give yourself 17 seconds to breathe and say thank you then just let whatever happens happens to you finally i leave you with these words i'm so happy to see my friend chip babcock who is my attorney here his wife nancy is a trustee here and 
Chip and I go way back to 1998, where I was on trial for saying something bad about a burger. It's under, Oprah said something bad about a burger. So I said something bad about a burger, and I was on trial in Texas for six weeks, night and day, nine to five, on the witness stand for days, testifying about burgers. And I was confused. I was like, I don't understand. I was a mess. I was a wreck. I forgot about intention. I forgot about. And I had to get myself still. It was hard to be still because the cattlemen, they wanted to take me down. Okay, so I'm on the witness stand, stand being tried for saying something bad about a burger. And the prosecutor is saying, you young lady conspired to bring down the entire beef industry. Did you not? And you strategized with your team and you came up with the idea that you were going to do everything you could to take out the cattle industry. Did you not? So, I didn't. The more he was spitting on me and charging me with, this, this, this really struck me. At one point he says, this young lady is a liar because she knew and deliberately tried to take my clients out. It's offensive when you're called a liar and you're not. And the more he spit and the more he railed and ranted, something happened to me in the midst of this crisis. I started to get still, which is my prayer for you. I started to get still. The crazier he got, the calmer I became. And finally, would he call me a liar? I knew in that moment, well now, that is not my truth. You can say a lot of things, but I am not a liar and I did not conspire to take down the entire beef industry. And the more still I became, the happier I got. I'm in the midst of this trial. Chip can tell you, I came off the witness stand and I went, that was great. He said, why? I said, because I got to see and figure out who I really was in the face of being called a liar, being called a conspirator, being told who I was not. And what I know is all trial, everybody goes through trials. I just happen to be in an actual trial. All people, if you live long enough, there's gonna be a trial in your life. It may be disease, it may be jobs, it may be any number of crises that stand outside yourself to try to tell you who you are. Are you not? And it is your job to know the truth and let that truth set you free. So we are a couple of weeks, of course, into 2022. And I know that so many people have made resolutions. Some of you already broke them already. Whether it's to put your health at the top of your to-do list or follow your passion. I know the mark of a new year is that we've been conditioned to reset and get all pumped up for our next chapter and all the possibility that awaits. But I want to propose something to you all today. I want to propose that you resolve something very powerful to love who you are right now. And of course, I think that wanting to be your best self and setting goals and intentions is really major. But I remember during a stop on the 2020 Vision Tour, I met this reporter in Miami. We took some photos together and she said to me, Oprah, next time you see me, I'm gonna be so much skinnier. And I replied, well, the next time I see you, hopefully you're gonna be as healthy as you can be in that moment. Because right now, this is as healthy as you can be in this moment. And the next time you'll be as healthy as you can be in that moment. I told her to be kind to herself. And she looked at me and said, how do I do that? Well, it starts with loving right now who you are, all yourself, your flaws, 
living in a space of lack focused on what you don't want or what you don't like about yourself, I, I promise you I've learned it doesn't work. Take a moment to look at what is really running through your mind about yourself that may be holding you back. The energy of the universe responds to positivity. And so if you're telling yourself you're not slim enough, you're not good enough, when that negative chatter starts in your head, stops, lean away from it. When you let those thoughts of not being enough seep in, you can't really act out the best of yourself. So your actions must be in alignment with all the goodness and strength that you know to be true about yourself. So this week, I'm inviting you to put on your happy sweater, wherever it is or whatever that is for you, quiet all the negative self-talk and allow your confidence, your sense of knowing that better days are ahead to be at the forefront of your thinking. Tomorrow is never promised, so let's accept and then let's celebrate ourselves just where we are right now. Thank you. Thank you for where I am and who I am right now. Let that be the blessing and intention for ourselves this week. You know, when I was a kid, I thought I was going to be a social worker or be a teacher or somehow be in an environment where I would be connected and speaking to people to honor that calling. I had no idea that God could dream this big dream of a television life for myself. But everybody has a calling and your real job in life is to figure out as soon as possible what that is, who you were meant to be, and begin to honor that in the best way possible for yourself. We have seen over the years on The Oprah Show so many people who've been able to rise to success in their life and only able to rise to success because they answered the call. Lots of people think that it's about being famous or about being known or about doing big, big, incredible things. What you're gonna hear today and see through the stories is that sometimes the calling is right in your own neighborhood. Sometimes the calling is something that was just a whisper to you. And when you begin to honor that whisper and to follow that, you end up being the best that you could be. So in my own life, I, I have to say that I had no idea that I would end up being who I have become, but I had a, a strong belief that the calling was something greater than what Mississippi was showing me. The calling was greater than my front yard. The calling was greater than what my grandmother believed that my life could be. The problem is everybody is meeting hysteria with more hysteria. And then we just are all becoming hysterical and it's getting worse. What I've learned all these years is that we're not supposed to match it or even get locked into resisting or pushing against it. We're supposed to see this moment in time for what it is. We're supposed to see through it and then transcend it. That is how you overcome hysteria. And that is how you overcome the sniping at one another, the trolling, the mean-spirited partisanship on both sides of the aisle, the divisiveness, the injustices, and the out-and-out -out hatred. You use it. Use this moment to encourage you, to embolden you, and to literally push you into the rising of your life. And to borrow a phrase from my beloved mentor, Maya Angelou, just like moons and like suns, with the certainty of tides, just like the hopes springing high, you will rise. Well, you know, I managed to get here. Stedman and I have absolutely uh, differing philosophies because he um, teaches the idea of, he has a book called, You Can Make It Happen, Nine Steps to Success. And he's always um, talking to me about having a vision, that with, with no vision, the people perish. And I always say, oh, I didn't have a vision. I didn't have a vision to get here, to where I am. My vision was uh, surrendering to what I believe is, was God's vision for me. And I always say, God can dream a bigger dream for you than you can dream for yourself. I now believe that I need a vision. I think Stedman is finally right, that uh, in order to continue to move forward, that I need to develop a vision for myself. And, um, one of my big goals is to use this television show as a forum, 
and a catalyst for change in people's lives. That's one of them. The other is to move out into the world in a, a more impactful global format to help women and children across the globe. Without education, the people perish. Without education, nobody will be able to survive. Without education, women cannot overcome poverty, will not be able to learn to take care of themselves, will not be able to move forward on the planet. So I want to use my life and this television show to continue to do that. I think some people think that, are under the impression that I was born empowered, that I was born coming out of the womb, ready to interview a Klansman. But the truth is, I know very well what it's like to be marginalized, to be told either subtly or quite directly that my contribution isn't or wasn't welcome, that my face was invisible, and that my needs were an affront. So back when I was doing the news in Baltimore, I asked to be paid the same as my co-anchor, who did exactly the same job as I was doing. And I expected that I would be compensated. So I went in and I asked that I would get the same amount of money. So he was doing the same job I was doing, except that he called me babe all the time. Babe, yeah, babe. Anyway, I was told by my news director and by the general manager, because first I went to the news director, then I went to general manager, and I was told that because I was a single woman who didn't have a mortgage and I didn't have kids, that I was not entitled to earn the same kind of money as the man who was sitting next to me doing the same thing. And I realized in that moment that my employers did not get it. They did not understand my value. But you know what? I did. So cut to AM Chicago. The team's hard at work, and they had been working for a long time. And after a year or so, we were asked to be syndicated. That work began to pay off. And before long, we were now no longer called AM Chicago. We're the national Oprah Winfrey show. I got a raise, but my producers did not. So I went into the boss at the time, and I asked that my producers, who incidentally were all female, I asked that they would be given a pay raise increase. And my boss, this is in 1986, said, why? They're only girls. What do they need more money for? Girls. Uh, I've used the word affectionately sometimes, referring to women as girls. And there was no affection in his tone. It was absolutely condescending. So, you know, it takes a while to develop a voice, but once you have it, you damn sure better use it on stuff that matters. So I took a deep breath in that moment and said, either they're gonna get raises or I'm gonna sit down. I'm not gonna work if they don't get paid more, babe. I would like to believe that I could have spoken that kind of truth to misogyny, even if I'd been all by myself. But here I was on the brink of finally getting what I really wanted and had been working uh, many years for, a national show. I mean, I might have been too intimidated to stand my own ground against this guy if I were actually alone. But here's the thing, you're never alone. You're never alone. The sovereign sound of Maya Angelou's voice was pushing me forward that day, whispering, I come as one, but I stand as 10,000. So when I was faced with the opportunity to advocate for my producers, I silently called on some of the 10,000 and walked into my boss's office, hand in spirit with the women who had come before me. I could feel Bessie Smith and Billie Holiday and Ella Fitzgerald and Pearl Bailey and Sarah Vaughn and Lena Horn clutching their green books looking for a place to eat while they sang in supper clubs for whites only. And I could feel Reese Taylor and Rosa Parks refusing to relinquish their dignity in the face of death threats. All these women were with me that day walking into the office in Chicago, as was Diana Carroll and Petula Clark and Joan Baez, and Mary Tyler Moore, and Moms Mabley, and Barbara Walters, and all of the astonishing women whose names none of us will ever even know, despite their sacrifice. And I'm pretty sure I even heard Shirley Chisholm urging me on with this thought. 
If they don't give you a seat at the table, bring a folding chair. I understood that there were so many times that many women from my mother's generation and God knows my grandmother's generation who were forced to grit their teeth and just take it because standing up for themselves wasn't even an option. The risk was too great and they knew it. But they also knew in their bones what my dear friend Maya put so eloquently into words when she says, you may not control all the events that happen to you, but you can decide not to be reduced by them. Because these women and so many others like them made the decision not to allow themselves to be reduced by the many injustices they were subjected to, I found the strength to act, if not just for myself, not just for my producers, but for all the women who in their ingenious ways subverted the rules, laid the foundation, and pushed the envelope just a little bit further for me. We all are here to fulfill the dreams of those who came before us. Maya used to say, you've been paid for. You've been paid for, young people, so put your crown on your head and wear it. We are here not merely to bear witness, but to be the new voices of an extraordinary new age. You see, when I was growing up, there were no black people in the media, just buckwheat, on television. And I was constantly doing that thing, looking to find myself. And what I found and said was, leave it to Beaver and Donna Reed and Lassie, although technically I guess Lassie was mostly brown. The, 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 the point is though, we are now able to see ourselves reflected through entertainment. But what pleases me most is that we're beginning to see on screen, what we're beginning to see is starting to change the landscape of what we see behind the scenes. What Kamal was talking about, true inclusion. And what I realized during all those years doing the Oprah show, and the reason that OWN is now thriving, is how essential it is to see yourself reflected in other people's stories. It's something that you, as white people, never have to even think about. Because the more you see a broader and richer and more nuanced depiction of yourself and your neighbor and the world, the more empowered you become. And it's that sense of empowerment that actually tethers us to the universe. It gives us at least a glimpse of how connected we all are. So what a blessed sign of progress it is to know that millions of kids in 2019 don't have to stand with their noses pressed up against the window or the television screens looking in at a family that makes them feel less than by comparison. Today we can point to work that says you are every bit as valued and vital to the fabric of life as anyone else. You are a part of a community. But it takes time. It takes time to see yourself, it takes time to hear yourself, and to feel, to feel appreciated for just being yourself. Empowerment does not happen overnight. Like change, it is never just one thing. It is a series of consistent steps, great and small, that proves to us again and again that genuine change is actually possible. So many people are worried about building a brand. I hear kids on social media talking about their brand. And I used to really resent the word when people would say to me, oh, you have this brand, because I never, never even thought about a brand. I just thought about day in and day out making the best right choice for me. But now I embrace it because I recognize people see me as a brand. But for me, it's not a business. It is a question of what do you stand for? And I will say this, you're nothing if you're not the truth. And, and that's the, if I could leave you with any message today, that is it. Uh, the biggest reward is not financial benefits, though it's really good, you can get a lot of great shoes. <laughs> Nothing wrong with great shoes. But those of you who have a lot of shoes know that having great shoes and a closet full of shoes or cars or houses or square footage doesn't fill up your life. It doesn't. But living a life of substance can. Substance through 
your service, your offering of your whole self. And the baseline for how do you live a life of substance is whatever is the truth for you. What do you stand for? People may not remember your every word. They may not remember all of your actions, but they certainly remember how your words and your actions made them feel. So let's leave here today with the collective memory of wanting to create enlightenment in the world. Let's leave here knowing that we can give people the sense that they have been heard and respected. Let's foster original thinking and humane treatment. Let's seek out the words we don't know. Let's do away with the us and them. I've seen us and them create a whole lot of problems, but I've never seen it solve one thing. Instead, let's nourish our artists. Let's offer the possibility of something better for all of us because a new day is no longer on the horizon. The new day is now. One of the things I started to get around mid to late 90s is that everybody that I had on the show at the end of the show would say something to me like, was that okay? Was that okay? How was that? Was that okay? Right. At the end of the interview. And I started to then track it. It didn't matter if it was, I, I, I had gone and done a show where I was in um, a prison and I was interviewing a father who was in jail for life for murdering his twin daughters. And at the end of the interview, even behind bars, he said to me, is that okay? How'd I do? And Barack Obama said it when he sat in the chair the first time. And George Bush said it. This is what I learned uh, sitting in that chair for 25 years. That at the end of the day, whether you are interviewing me or I get to interview you, whatever your profession is, wherever you are in your life, in your relationships, every person that you encounter, every experience, the person wants to know, was that okay? Was that okay? And what I started to hear was that what people are really saying is, did you hear me? Did you hear me? And did what I say mean anything right. to you? And so I started to listen with that in mind, with that intention of validating that your being here, your speaking to me, your taking the time to do this with me is important because you matter. And that's true for everybody who's watching or listening, that every argument that you ever have, every encounter, the person just wants to know, did you hear me? Did you see me? And did I say anything that mattered? Everybody works hard and everybody has their own dreams. There was a time where I used to spend a lot of energy wanting things. Of course, it's easy for me to say, oh, things don't define you because I got a lot of things. Things are nice, I like them. But this is what I learned. When you can surrender to the dream, you get to live in the space of the higher power. You get to live in the space that you purposefully have come to earth to claim for yourself. So around 1984, I was sitting in bed one morning. I was reading the New York Times review of The Color Purple. And I thought, whoa, this sounds like a really great book. I got out of bed in my pajamas, put on my galoshes, and went to the store to get the copy of The Color Purple. I read The Color Purple in one afternoon, got, went back to the bookstore, bought every book of The Color Purple. I took the books to, to the office and I said to everybody, y'all got to read this book. Oh my God, you got to read this book, Color Purple. I needed a book club. I didn't have one. So I pass out the book to everybody I knew. Please read the Color Purple, read the Color Purple. Then I start to hear that somebody's going to do a movie about the Color Purple. But I don't know anybody in the movie business. By this time, I was on AM Chicago. I don't know anybody. I start praying to God. God, please help me find a way to get into Color Purple. I say, Jesus, I don't even have to have a speaking part. I will be, because I went to the movies and I saw on the movie credits, at the last credit, there's something called best boy. So I said, Jesus, if you just let me be best girl, that'd be all right by me. I can be best girl. I can carry the script. I can help the people with the water. I can do whatever. So I start praying for the color purple as divine law would have it. Quincy Jones 
comes to Chicago and he is in Chicago for one half of a day because somebody has filed a suit against Michael Jackson claiming that Billie Jean was their lover and that's not his song. So Quincy had taken the red eye to Chicago. He was in his hotel room. He was coming out of the shower and the television in his hotel room is on AM Chicago. There sits little chubby me with my Jerry curl on AM Chicago. Quincy Jones tells Ruben Cannon, the casting agent, I think I found Sophia. So I get a call from Ruben Cannon who says, I'm calling about a movie. It's called Moonsong. Would you be interested to come and audition? And I say, I have not been praying for Moonsong. I have not been playing for Moonsong. I've been praying for the color purple. He said, well, I think you should come and, and, and audition. So I go to audition. You know, movie people, they make everything all secret. Steven Spielberg didn't want anybody to know he was doing color purple. So on the outside of the script, it says Moonsong. But I know all the words by heart. So when I open the script, I know this is the color purple Jesus. This is the color purple. So I auditioned for The Color Purple. I can't even believe it. They don't just want me to be the water girl or the best girl. They are asking me, do I want a part in the movie? Oh, that, that, I'm thinking prayer, prayer works. Three months pass. Three months is a long time. I auditioned in February, March, April, May comes. I haven't heard anything. So I call Ruben Cannon. I say, Mr. Cannon, I'm sorry, sir, I haven't heard anything. I expected to hear something by now. And Reuben Cannon, African-American man, says to me, you don't call me, I call you. And I didn't call you. Do you understand that I have real actresses who have auditioned for this part? Real actresses. And he tells me who just left his office. And I went, well, okay, I'm not getting that part. So I hang up the phone and I start crying. I can't believe that God has played this trick on me. I think. This is a trick. So I decide that this is because the fat has finally caught up with me. The fat has finally caught up with me and now I must get rid of the fat. In two weeks, I am going to go to a fat farm and I'm going to lose 25 pounds. I'm gonna drink a lot of green juice. I'm going to have some cleanses and colonics. So I also was trying to make peace with it. I said, God, I don't understand. I thought it was for me. You ever had that talk with God? I, I, I thought it was for me. I thought it was for me. God, you let me audition with somebody named Harpo. That's my name backwards. Jesus, that was a sign. Wasn't it a sign? And then three months pass, and then, then Ruben Cannon says, real actresses have just left his office. So I start to pray on the track. I'm out on the track at the fat farm, and I am running around at the track at the fat farm. It starts to rain. Y'all know how that is. But I don't even care, because I am praying to God to help me to let it go. Help me let it go because now I've become obsessed with it and it's now controlling my life. I start praying, running around the track, and I keep hearing this noise, and I, I can't, there's nobody on the track but me, and I'm running around the track. And I look around and it is my thighs rubbing together. My thighs are rubbing together, causing this thunderous sound there's nobody on the track so then I really start to cry oh Lord help me help me let it go help me let it go help me let it go God help me let it go and you ever did this prayer where you say okay Lord okay I'm gonna let it go then you get up and you go well I think I still got a little bit of it I did help me let it go but I'm not gonna be able to see the other actress in my part I won't be able to see it I won't be able to see color purple just can't never see it the rest of my life I won't be able to see it so then I started I don't know where it came from I surrender all I surrender all all to thee
Thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all. I sang and I cried. I sang and I cried and I prayed some more until I could reach the point where not only, not only will I be able to go to the movie, but I can bless the other actress. I can bless her. I can say, I bless you. I bless you. I bless you with this. I surrender all. I surrender all. All to thee, my blessed Savior. I surrender all. And I tell you in my greatest testimony that the instant I laid that thing down I'm telling you when I laid it down when I laid it down and it didn't have me anymore it had no control over me anymore I didn't feel anything about it anymore when I let it go when I intentionally surrendered it to the power that was greater than I could ever know. The instant that happened, a woman comes running out of the cafeteria screaming, Ofri, is your name Ofri? For 10 years, nobody could pronounce my name. I said, yeah, she said, somebody's on the telephone for you. He said, his name's Spielberg. I get to the phone. He says, I hear you're at a fat farm. I said, no, sir. This is a health retreat. He says, I'd like to see you in my office in California tomorrow. This, is, this was in Wisconsin. I was, I'd like to see you in my office. And if you lose a pound, you could lose this part. No problem do I have. I don't have no problem not losing a pound. So honey, I packed my bags and I stopped at the Dairy Queen. I got three scoops just in case I'd lost a half a pound. And the next day I was in Steven Spielberg's office and he said, you're hired, you're hired. You have no idea of the power of noticing another human being and what it feels like when somebody knows that they have been seen, truly seen by you. It is the greatest offering you can give. And all those years of The Oprah Show, the greatest lesson I learned was that, you know, after every show, uh, someone would say invariably in one way or another, um, how was that? I'd finish an interview with the father who killed his twin daughters. I'd finish an interview with politician, Barack Obama, Joe Biden, George Bush, they, Beyonce, they all say the same thing. How is that? And so I started to see that there's this common thread in our humanity where everybody wants to know, how was that? Did I do okay? Did you hear me? And did what I say mean something to you? So I would have to say that recognizing that in other people has helped me to become, you know, a person of compassion, a person of understanding, a person who can interview anybody about anything, because I know that if the core of you is the same as the core of me, you just want to be heard.